Hello, and welcome to the Juniper Networks Learning Byte series. I'm Josh McKenzie, a content developer with Juniper Education Services. And today, we're going to be looking at the process for defining and deploying an application using Docker. So by the end of this content, you will have learned how to define and deploy a very, very simple web application using Docker. First, we want to talk about how images are managed in the Docker environment. And there are really two places you're going to see Docker images. As a reminder, an image defines the parameters and the settings that are used to create a running instance of a container. So we're going to see images first in our local cache. So anytime we pull images from Docker Hub or build images into containers, the proximate source is always going to be our local image cache. Images can also be stored in Docker Hub, which is, of course, a cloud repository for Docker images. We can also see the basic image management commands here. So if we want to create a new image, we can build one based on a Docker file. We're going to see what Docker file syntax looks like in just a moment with the Docker build command. The dash T argument here allows me to set a tag on that image. The first part of that tag will be my account name on Docker Hub, if I am planning on uploading this to the hub. And the second will be the actual unique name for that image. And then the path to the location of my files. So any files that might be part of that container. Uh, the dot is just my local directory. Once I've defined that image, I can just run it directly from my local cache using Docker Run. Or I can use Docker Push to push that up to Docker Hub. This does require that I be logged in to a valid Docker Hub account. Once it is on the Docker Hub repository, I can then pull it down on any local Docker system. This is really useful in terms of development and mass deployment because I can define my image in one location, upload it to the Hub, and then any server where I'm actually running that instance, whether it's my own local server or a cloud service like AWS or Azure, they can all pull from that same image in that uh, central repository. Uh, Docker Hub has three types of repositories, public, private, and official. These are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, if you want a private repository, that does require a subscription. Anyone can create and use a free public repository, much like GitHub. The catch there, of course, is that everyone can see and use your containers. So if for some reason you have a container that needs to remain private, that's when you want to pay for a subscription. Otherwise, you know, let the world use it. Uh, there are also official repositories. These are sponsored repositories by Docker or other major vendors. You can see some examples here. Uh, one that we're actually going to be using in this example will be the, the Python official image. Uh, one big difference you'll notice is that the naming convention for these does not include an account name. It's just the name of the image followed by a tag to indicate the version. Now, Docker has a lot of functionality that helps reduce its footprint on your hardware. And Docker layers is a really important concept to understand when we're dealing with images. So whenever we're building an image definition in Docker, it's actually being built out in layers based on previously existing images. Uh, this helps save space and promote reusability. So on this slide, we have an example of the Juniper Pi Easy Ansible image. This is actually a Docker Hub image maintained by Juniper. It contains our PyEZ libraries. That's our Python libraries for automating our devices, uh, as well as Ansible, a very handy tool as well. And you can actually see that is based on several previously existing images. So first off, we have Alpine 3.6. Alpine is a really popular base image for building Docker containers because it contains a lot of common Linux runtimes, but is extremely small. So it's very lightweight. Notice that's read only. We don't want to be modifying that base image that's used by thousands and thousands of containers. On top of that, we have PyEZ installed. So that is its own layer. So the actual, just the PyEZ libraries create their own read only layer. Then the Ansible libraries create their own read only layer. And then when we instantiate a container, using PyEZ Ansible, we also get access to our own read-write layer. So in practical terms, what this means is that if I spin up a hundred copies of this PyEZ Ansible image, everything here that's read-only is stored only a single time, or at least that's the default behavior. So I don't have to have that same data replicated over and over and over and over and over again on my storage. It's stored just once 
all of the containers access it because it's read only. The only portion of my file system that can actually be modified by each specific container instance is this read write layer. So this gives me a lot of control over what my containers can actually modify, prevents them from interfering with other containers, and it also reduces dramatically the amount of disk space that my containers actually consume. So really important concept here. And when we get into Docker files, bear in mind that each individual line in a Docker file creates its own layer. We're not going to get into that today, but that is actually one of the ways you can tune and optimize your images when you're building them is by being careful about how you build out those commands and those layers. That's a little beyond our scope for today. All right, so we're going to define a very simple web service. To do this, we are going to use Flask. It's a very popular Python web framework. We're gonna be keeping it super basic here, and we're not going to stop to explain how the Python works. If you're familiar with Python, it should be pretty clear what's happening in this example. If not, all you really need to know is that this is our Python file. That's the entirety of our web service in this case. And all this is going to do is return a page with a simple string that says, welcome to my web server. And we're gonna be serving this on port 8080. We also have a requirements document. This is going to be used within our Docker file to install our Python dependencies. Another key practice when we're working with containers, and this is one of the advantages of containers from a development perspective, is that we document all of our dependencies in the container definition. So here are our Python dependencies, these three libraries. And the last component of our application is going to be our Docker file. So this tells Docker how to actually build out our container definition. Uh, let's go ahead and hop to the code editor so we can see this with some highlighting in place. Okay, so here we are in our code editor. Let's take a quick look at our project directory before we start building it. So here is our Python script provides our web server. We've already seen our requirements, just one Python library per line, very simple. And then our Docker file. So the first line of this Docker file defines the starting image. So this is our baseline image. It's gonna be read only. In this case, we're using the official Python image. This will by default grab the most recent image. I can also specify a version using the tag. So colon, and then the tag in this case will specify Python 2.7. I'm just going to let it use the latest version of Python, which should be 3.8. something. You can also use truly base images and build them out from scratch. So you could use one of the minimal Linux uh, images like Alpine, or you can use your own images. They're already in the Docker Hub repository. Totally up, up to you, totally flexible. Next up, the label just lets me set some metadata. This is not in any way required. In this case, I'm using it to set the author name. Next up, the copy directive is going to take two arguments. The first is the source directory, which is going to be on my local system. So the system where I'm actually building this container. And the second argument will be the destination on that container. This, by the way, is a volume, has to have already been defined on this image. So I'm gonna create a read-only copy of that volume and then put the contents of my local directory, which in this case will contain all three of these files, into the container at that mount point, at the app directory. Work dear functions like change directory. So it's going to park me in this folder so that any commands I run are going to be from that context. I can then use run to run commands. This is a very common way to build out an image. Each run command will create its own layer. So if I wanted to add packages with pip, which is what I'm doing here, or if I need to install packages using the local package manager, like aptitude, if this was Ubuntu, I could use run commands to do that as well. After I've installed my dependencies, I then need to actually tell this container to listen on a port. By default, there are no ports already open on these containers. So I need to specify that I want to expose port 8080. So that's going to tell that container to listen on port 8080. If you go back and look at my application, you can see when I actually run my Flask application, I'm telling it to serve on port 8080. So those do need to match. Then we have entry point. Entry point defines the actual executable, the process that I'm going to be running inside of this container. So I'm going to be running Python executable. And then I can use the CMD or command argument to pass arguments into that executable. So I'm telling it to run my app.py script. And that's what's ultimately going to actually serve my Flask application. 
So now we can go to my connection to my uh, Docker device. You can see I'm in my project directory right now. There are my three files. And now we want to go ahead and build this into a image. So we'll use Docker build. Auto Funbot is my account. And then we're just going to call this my app. We specify where we're building the app from. So just the current directory. So we'll specify a dot. So it's going to start by pulling down that official Python image as my starting image. And then it will build out the remainder of this image based on the commands I've provided. All right. So now that this image has been built, I should actually be able to see this in my local cache. So if I do a Docker image list, you can see there's the Python image that I had to download as a base. And then I have my auto fun bot, my app image that I just defined. By the way, if you look at the sizes here, you can see these look fairly large. So this Python image is almost a gigabyte. And then I have my my app image, which is also almost a gigabyte. But the truth is, this combination of those two images is basically just 949 megabytes because this image is using all of this and just creating an additional 15 megabyte layer on top of that. So uh, we're using our storage very efficiently here. Uh, let's go ahead before we spin up this web service, let's go ahead and push it. So use Docker push. We'll specify the name of the image in our local cache. So that's going to send that up to Docker Hub. So anyone can now go download that. In fact, if you're watching this video right now, you can go to Docker Hub and download this image. All right, now we want to go ahead and build it out. So we'll go ahead and run Docker run. And there's a couple extra commands we're going to want to provide here. We want this process to run in the background. So we'll use the dash D option to run this detached. We also need to do a port mapping. So the container is currently listening on port 80, but I want to actually expose a port on this host so that I can actually access that container from outside of this host. So we'll use dash P and we're going to map or to 8080 on the host to 8080 on the container. And then we have the name of our container. So auto funbot, my app. All right, so it looks like it was successful. I can now do a Docker container list to see my running containers. And let's make this a little wider so it's easier to read. All right, so you can see I now have a running container, auto funbot, my app. You can see the command that's running inside of that container as well as port mappings. Incidentally, Docker assigns these random names. You can also provide your own name with the name argument, like so. All right, now to test that our application is working as expected, we can go ahead and point our web browser at it. And here we go. So we can see our very simple web server is returning, hello world, welcome to my web server. Thanks for joining me for this uh, Juniper Networks Learning Byte. I hope you found this very useful, and I hope to see you for the next one. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.